are still in the same series, which is Baptist hobby horses, old Baptist hobby horses, revisiting those is the idea. And so today we're talking about uh, many preachers' favorite hobby horse, which is tithing, right? Tithes and offerings. And uh, just thinking through things historically, uh, you know, old Baptist preaching, you know, you heard a lot of subjects. As a result of that, over time, People have kind of shied away from preaching about it. And so the thing about revealing them is, hey, there's some good reasons to keep preaching on these topics. And then maybe in some of these cases, hey, this is why we stop preaching it, because people are, are you know, going to whatever. But anyway, I've enjoyed this series. I think this is like number 11 in the series or something like that. And so uh, I don't know how many more we'll do, but... I thought we would deal with tithe, tithes and offerings, and because of the subject and the, the nature of it and the way I kind of felt like I wanted to present it, I decided to go with this kind of fill in the blank like we would do in Iola during Sunday school or for a while here, even on uh, Thursday nights for ministry training, uh, that kind of a feel. We would do this fill in the blank. I feel like it'll be a little bit easier. It's more of a, a teaching style. I even went casual for you today, okay? So uh, no jacket. <laughs> <laughs> no white shirt. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but the idea is uh, hopefully filling in the blanks, make it a little bit more uh, easier to follow, and then you'll have the take with it. And, you know, here's how I feel about it. I believe Christians should be involved in giving to the Lord. We'll see that in the, uh, in the, the lesson. I do believe tithing is a biblical principle, and I believe there's no reason to believe that God ever decided to uh, put it into the principle of the tithing. Like we could look at some ceremonial type laws and say, you know, we're not expected to follow those anymore. Uh, I don't think tithing as a whole has been done away with. Now, some people say, no, no, tithing was an Old Testament thing, and and now they're still giving. But uh, I've even heard people that they'll, they're so strongly against tithing. But whenever you nail them down, they're like, well, I think. New Testament giving should just should be more than tithing because it should be just giving, you know, as much as you can and when your heart desires to give or whatever. I, I want to show you tonight what, you know, the principle of just tithes and offerings is, okay? Now, technically, by definition, a tithe is a tenth, you know, so of, of all your increase, the principle is to give a tenth. We'll talk about this. And then offerings would be something that you just freely give above and beyond that tithe. And look at your the first part there under the introduction. And let me just say, too, that I decided to do this fill-in-the-blank thing at the last minute, so uh, we might have a lot of typos and stuff, excuse me, if we do. All right, passing an offering plate or trying to receive money from people in any way is uncomfortable, okay? not Maybe not for everybody, but for me, it is. When a visitor comes in and you pass the plate in front of them, it's uncomfortable. We had a visitor in... Uh, in Iola, and I gave him a card, you know, hey, just just give some information about yourself, good to have you, we'd like to have a record of your visit, and we give him a card, and they began filling it out, and then I said, hey, when the offering plate comes by, just go ahead and put that card in, and when I mentioned offering plate, the visitor looked down at her purse, like, oh no, do I have something to give, like it's just this expected, you know, thing, I don't know the heart, I would never tell somebody not to give, but it's so uncomfortable to me to like pass the plate and put it in front of me, like, hey, I've been at churches where they have where they send kids out to do it because the kids know how to like really get the <laughs> and they'll just stop in front of you like that's all you're gonna give <laughs> you know uh, and I've been at places where they pass the offering plate and the pastor said I just don't feel like we gave it. <laughs> I'm like it's awkward man it's 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 kind of uh, it's kind of awkward uncomfortable situation and this is why I believe a lot of preachers don't want to preach on it. This is why I shy away from preaching on it, but it is biblical, the biblical principles of tithing and uh, giving offerings, even if you're against tithing uh, as a Old Testament method of giving, uh, giving is biblical, you know, and so this is why we continue to do it. There are churches I know of that did away with passing the offering plate, and they put like a box or something in the back of the church that says, hey, tithes and offerings, and then people can just at their own leisure put it in there. I personally am not against that. I've heard some people, oh, that's terrible. I passed the, oh, this is the way they do it. This is the way the, this is the way uh, 
we independent Baptists have always done it or whatever, but look, I don't know. The gift should be between the person and God. Uh, I don't like to uh, make a huge deal about it. However, there are many religious organizations, and there are those who claim to be churches that I would lump in here and say they're just a religious organization, not a church, okay? But many religious organizations that take advantage of people and pressure them for their money, and that's all it's all about. And uh, the pastors, you know, got to have his next, uh, you know, uh, Rolls Royce or or private jet or something. <laughs> and so they got to keep those offerings coming in. We don't want to be like that, okay? So this is why it's an uncomfortable situation. And being a pastor and knowing, you know, the hard times that some people go through and are going through, look, it's hard enough for some people just to pay the bills. I got a text uh, just a few minutes ago. On our website, we get a lot of these. We get a lot of phone calls. We get a lot of knocks on the door at the church. People saying, hey, we need help paying the bills. We need help with the rent. We need help with the uh, utilities. And you say, wow, really? They go to churches and they ask for that all the time, all the time. They feel like, hey, these people, you know, they're uh, goody two-shoes, whatever. I know, that's not the word I'm looking for. But yeah, good. they, they want to do good, do-gooders. They want to give. So, hey, I'm going to let them give to me. And so sometimes people do that. Uh, but uh, as a result, you know, people will uh, sometimes uh, church uh, churches or religious organizations or whatever will just say, "Hey, we got to give to the poor and we got to do it," and so they're just constantly getting uh, uh, taking money and all that. Uh, oh, I know, I was on the third point. Sorry, <laughs> I got distracted. Okay, so it is hard enough, and I do see people struggling. I do see people that can't hardly pay their their bills. And let's be honest, we could say, well, of course, there's a lot of unwanted, uh, unnecessary spending. You know, I remember hearing this missionary got up and he said, okay, I know missionaries always asking for money and they're always needing this. And they said, and everybody says, oh, I can't do anything for missions. And, and the whole point of his message, was like, you can do something. And he said, what if you decided, and he brought this Coke, the Snickers bars, and he put it up on the platform and he, Coke and a Snickers bar, and he said, what can you give up? week like some of you guys drink this and eat this every day couldn't you give it up once a week and uh, and you would have that much money and he calculated how much it would be you'd be given to the cause of missions look I'm not against that kind of preaching I'm not against people deciding to do that and give more but me as a pastor and thinking about people who just want to live their life they want to like provide for their family and they want to be able to enjoy them and and I I don't like just focusing on hey you can give more you could give a little bit, because here's the other thing, too. I feel hypocritical. If I'm like, hey, give a little bit more. we got to have a little bit more money. And then I'm just like, you know, eating. I mean, I don't have any problem. I don't miss very many meals, right? And so, uh, so you know, it's hard to ask people to give, all right? But, and so you can imagine why the preaching is not uh, popular, but it is in the Bible. It is a biblical principle. So I just want to talk about that and share a few points here. Uh, anybody need a pen or a pencil? Maybe we can locate one for you. I didn't think about bringing those. Uh, can you find a pen, pen or a pencil? I, th I think I saw Braden digging through some drawers in there trying to find them. I did just help you be able to follow along and have this. The very first blank up there in the introduction was uncomfortable if you didn't catch that. Asking for money is uncomfortable. Okay, so Roman numeral number one. The obvious purpose. Okay, the obvious purpose. Why do we give? Why? What's the point of giving? Who do we say we're giving to? Some people say ultimately our giving should be to the Lord, right? So the, the obvious purpose here. The obvious purpose for giving to the Lord is to dis demonstrate our love. For him, to demonstrate our love for him. Now you can see where a preacher could twist that and say, "Come on, don't you love the Lord? Give a little bit more. Come on." <laughs> but that's not the the point. It's your love. It's between you and it's between God. Don't let anybody else try to milk more money out of you or something like that, right? But that is why we give. That is that should be why we give. And this is the uh, it's natural to want to do that. Okay, uh, we are to love the Lord. Every facet of our lives, all right, and this includes our finances. 
Look at Deuteronomy 6, 5. This is an interesting uh, little study if you want to do that. Jesus, we know in the Gospel accounts, quotes this, quotes this verse. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And let me just say this. Uh, I feel like this church loves the Lord and loves to give what they can give. In Iola, same principle. I love the Lord. They, I certainly don't preach this because I feel like the tithes and offerings are down and nobody's given. Uh, but look, it makes sense to me that when you see a church where people love the Lord, they love soul winning, they love to get behind the, the programs of the church and all that kind of stuff. Right? So uh, it makes sense. Deuteronomy 6, 5 says this. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk unto them uh, when thou sittest there. And what is the verse I'm looking for? Let me see here. Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. I started too far. Verse 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Now here's what's interesting about that. When Jesus quotes this in the gospel accounts we see a different word used all right so your first blank in, in there little a all our heart soul and might m-i-g-h-t might Matt, jesus quotes this matthew 22 verse 37 matthew 22 verse 37 Jesus said unto him, this is, he's asking, hey, which is the greatest commandment? Jesus said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy heart, all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Okay, you're not like his mind. You say, well, man, he's, what, did he, what kind of version was he reading out of? <laughs> It didn't say mind. It didn't say mind. He said mind. Well, this will really trip you up then. Look at Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. Same, same story, same account. Uh, I mean, uh, just Mark's, Mark's account of the same story. Mark 12, verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. So you've got heart, soul, mind, and then you've got heart, soul, mind, and strength. Or in Deuteronomy, what, the, what he's quoting, it said might. Okay? So the idea is, I believe, hey, you love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul, and then you love Him with everything else that you've got. You love Him with your mind. You know, you love Him with your, your might, your strength, what you have, with your body, with your resources. That, you just love God with every facet of your life. Anything you do, you want to do for the Lord. Anything that you have, you realize that it really belongs to God. I have children. Guess what? They belong to God. They're in God's hands, right? I'm just, I'm, there's just like a, uh, an inheritance. I've just got them for a temporary time, right? They belong to God. And really, if you love the Lord, you've got to think like that. Now, we're not, we're, we're, in, we're in the flesh too. We battle with the flesh. And obviously, we don't always think that way. And sometimes we get into this idea that we think of it as our, as our own. But look, you only have it because God gave it to you. So if you love the Lord, then if you think about it, it's really His. You know, now he wants you to enjoy your your things and the and the blessings that he gives you, and I'm going to show you here in the Bible where it, actually what he says is a tenth belongs to the Lord. Okay, uh, he wants you to have that, but but the idea is that if it's just an obvious purpose that we give is for is the fact that we love him, and demonstrating our love always involves some sort of sacrifice. If you think about it, how do you show your love for anybody? Well, how does a kid show their love for their parents? 
They obey them. That takes sacrifice. I don't want to obey, but I'm going to because I want to show my love and because I don't want to get a spanking. <laughs> okay. How do parents show their love towards their kids? Maybe they have mercy on them or something like that, or you know, they're, they're, they're patient with them, long-suffering with them. But love always takes sacrifice. You're going to have to give a little. You're going to have to endure. Uh, like Go through 1 Corinthians 13 and see charity is what? Long-suffering. Charity is, and it, and it goes through this whole list of things. Love is going to involve sacrifice in every facet of our life. Okay? And a second obvious purpose, uh, <clears throat> let's see here. Exodus 20. Let's look at those verses. I can't remember exactly. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so it, it, here's obvious purpose. God expects, it's like man knows that God expects that if we love him, we're going to give to him, okay? So we see right after the fall of man, we see the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4. Look at verse 3. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel uh, and to his offering. Now, there's a whole story. Obviously, we've preached on that, and, and I could preach a whole message on that. But the idea is that I don't know if God told Adam and Eve, hey, teach your sons and teach your future generations to bring a sacrifice to the Lord or what this process of time was. Or like, why did they decide to do this? I don't know. But from the very beginning, the point is that they had this in their mind, I need to bring something to the Lord. Now, we know that what God wanted them to bring was the sacrifice, the blood sacrifice. It was a picture of Jesus. We understand all that. But from the very beginning, this sacrifice something. I need to give of the firstling of my flock. I need to give of the firstling of my fruit. Uh, and this was this, this idea that's been from the very beginning. In Exodus 20, right after the Ten Commandments are given, <clears throat> look at uh, verse 24. Right after the commandments are given, he says, uh, and Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove... No, where am I? Am I in the right place? Okay. Uh, that's not right. Verse... Uh, I told you I did this in a hurry. <laughs> okay. I'm looking at... I think what I was looking for is where he talks about... Okay, keep going. Uh, look at verse 22. The Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel... Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make uh, with me gods of silver, neither shall you make unto me gods of gold. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, and thy sheep, and thy oxen. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto, you, unto thee, and I will bless thee. Right away, after the Ten Commandments are given, he says, oh, by the way, you're going to want to build an altar sacrifices, and here's how you build the altar. And it was just this thing that you're going to want to uh, to the Lord. Of course, I didn't even show all the different times in the Bible. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll mention some of them later on, uh, where in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis even, where they were giving to the Lord in various ways, of course, sacrifices and all that. Uh, it would be too many to look at all of those verses. All right, but uh, so that's demonstrating our love. It always involves some kind of sacrifice, and mankind knows that in our heart. We realize that, plus God just laid it out that way, that that would be the case. Okay, but then a second obvious purpose for giving to the Lord is so that with the money given, the Lord's work can be accomplished. Now, obviously, we know God can do anything. He doesn't need, if, God, if, if John the Baptist said, hey, God could raise from these stones the seed of Abraham, you know, the point is, God doesn't really need us. He doesn't need our money. He could easily do the work, okay? He doesn't need us to go preach the gospel theoretically. He could give everybody a vision. Everybody could hear, you know, hear the gospel, send an angel to them or whatever. But God chose that that's how we would preach the gospel, that we would go out, you know, as his church. We'd go out and we'd spread the gospel. And God chose that, hey, how will you finance this mission? 
how will you finance, you know, taking care of the people and having the different expenses for all these kinds of things? He says, you will, you know, you'll finance it from your own finances. <laughs> okay. So it's an obvious principle. Here's how you do it. And you say that, like, that's an obvious principle. Everybody knows that. But look, there's a lot of churches where people go and it's like, all they want to do is ask for money. All they want to do is ask for money. And never think like, well, how do you think this building is paid for? How do you think, you know, you have heat in here? How do you think we have water? How do you think, uh, you know, there's different material that we distribute and, and, and all these kinds of things. Where does all that come from? Well, it comes from giving, right? And this is the principle that makes sense. This is the obvious purpose. Okay, so... Uh, from our perspective, what is our means? Or in the, uh, in the parentheses, there are strength. Okay, we're going to love the Lord with all thy strength. Well, what is your strength? Well, sure, certainly you can give your health. You can give your might, your strength. Hey, we can go out there and knock on doors because we have our health. We have our, you know, but let's, let's realize in our society, there's a saying that says money talks, <laughs> right? There's power in money. Why? Because you need money to buy things. Okay, if you think about it, money is strength, okay? And so our strength of carrying on the Lord's work comes from uh, the fact that we have finances. And obviously, everybody has different uh, levels of income. And I'm getting way ahead of myself, but if you think about it, this is why tithe makes perfect sense. Everybody's given the same amount, okay? And so, uh, uh, and so this is the principle there. How are we going to support the work? Well, it's almost like a tax, but it's not a tax. I don't want to use that word, okay? But it's almost like that if you think. In fact, I think if I'm understanding, at least in the earlier, in the early days of church history, I think the Catholic Church basically taxed the people. Like you had to give your 10% or whatever it was. And there are still probably churches today that uh, that do it that way. Look, your giving is between you and the Lord. I don't care if it's tithe. I don't care, you know, tithe offering, what it is. I'm not ever going to like, pressure somebody into doing that. But I am going to show you what the Word of God says, and I think it only makes sense, okay, that this is how we would operate and how the church would function. Look at uh, Exodus 35. This is a this is a passage of Scripture that I always love reading it. It's like so bizarre. It's like something that you would never hear a preacher preach. <laughs> Okay. They would never say this. Exodus 35, verse 5. This is, uh, or let's start in verse 4. And Moses spake unto the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it, an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram's skins dyed red and badger skin, and shittim wood, and oil for the light. And he goes on with all these things to, to give. Now, these are offerings. This isn't a tithe. This is, these are just offerings. Hey, bring of the stuff that you have. Well, they didn't have money lying around, but they had physical things. Hey, you could bring this, and, uh, and we will use that for the work of the Lord. Now, skip down to uh, chapter 20, I mean, uh, verse 20. Chapter 35, verse 20 says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses, and they came everyone whose heart stirred him up, and everyone whom uh, his spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for all his service, and for the holy garments. Okay, and it goes on. Look at chapter 36 now. Chapter 36. Then wrought Bezliel... And Abaliah, Ahaliah, I got small print here, sorry. And every wise hearted man in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding to know how to work all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary, according to all that the Lord had commanded. And Moses called Bezaliel and Aholiab and every wise hearted man in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, and, uh, e even everyone whose heart stirred him up to come into the work to do it. And they received of Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of the sanctuary to make it withal. And they brought yet unto him free offerings every morning. And all the wise men that wrought all the work of the sanctuary came every man uh, from his work which they made. And they, and they spake unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work. 
and the Lord commanded to make uh, uh, that the Lord commanded to make. Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, "Let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary." So the people were restrained from bringing, for the stuff they had was sufficient. Take it and much. <laughs> Can you imagine a a preacher getting up one day and say, "Hey guys, you got to quit giving. You're giving too much." We just don't know what we're going to do with all this money. <laughs> okay, so quit giving. That ain't never going to happen. <laughs> They're going to keep on putting that money in the bank and say, uh, we'll, we'll find a way to use this money down, down the road, okay? <clears throat> but what was the point there? The point was, hey, we're going to do something for the Lord. We're going to build the tabernacle that he wants. How are we going to do that? Well, you're going to have to offer something. And so the people, it was naturally that they would want to offer I said, well, that just seems rude. I mean, like, couldn't they just, like, why do they need all that? Why do they need all this beautiful stuff, you know? Why couldn't they just worship God in just a, a plain building? Well, of course they could. But this tabernacle was something special for the Lord, and he wanted uh, uh, something good from it, so they contributed to the Lord's work. Now, I don't think it's important that the te- we're the temple of God, no matter where, what building we're in or where we're meeting or whatever, right? So I don't think it's important to have a physical building with luxuries and fancy uh, doodads and stuff like that. I can't believe I just said doodads. But, <laughs> you know, those things aren't important. All right? What's important is that we're able to accomplish the work of God, yes. Uh, that we're able to put more miles out there and knock more doors and all that kind of stuff. But look, it is good and right to have nice things. It is nice when a visitor comes in that they're not just like, whoa, I'm never going back to that place again. I mean, if restaurants and businesses can do their best, nice, accommodating to uh, a visitor. I mean, you want a place that you're going to invite somebody to come and be proud to show them that this is our, this is our place, this is where we meet. <sighs> Same thing, you know, uh, similar to the tabernacle and this idea of giving. This is These are obvious purposes, all right, for giving of tithes and offerings. Okay, now look. let's look at number two, Roman number two. We had the obvious purpose. Now let's look at the original Principle. The original principle. Exodus 22. I'm not obviously going to throw all the different verses on this, and, and I'm not as prepared as I probably should be in looking at some of these verses, but we're going to cover the basics here. The original principle, I would say the principle of the first fruits is the original idea. Okay, let's look at Exodus 22. Verse 29, he's given all these random uh, commandments, okay? After the Ten Commandments, we saw uh, some different things about the altar, and it just seems kind of like he's given these random commandments. And then whenever he comes to verse 29, it says, uh, Thou shalt not delay to offer the first of thy ripe fruits and of thy liquors, which is basically just talking about the fruit, I mean, the juice of the fruit, okay? It's not talking about alcoholic. The firstborn of thy sons shalt thou give unto me. Now, I don't know, I'm probably not uh, going to point to the verse that means this, okay? But the giving of the firstborn sons, there are people out there that say, look, in the Bible it was commanding that people sacrifice their sons. No, God forbid that anybody, forbid that anybody would do that, Okay. If you look up in other passages, I think in Deuteronomy, same idea. It says, is that, you know, they're sanctified unto the Lord, okay? So this principle of giving the son is, the firstborn son, was not that you would kill them and <laughs> sacrifice them, all right? The principle was that, hey, you would offer them to the Lord. This is your first child. This He's holy unto the Lord. He's sanctified. And uh, and I don't know. There's, there's uh, you know, probably a lot more that could be uh, uh, uncovered. Having the first fruits... Now, how many in here have grown a garden? Tomatoes, you know, maybe you've had uh, grapes or something like that. Uh, grapes take a while to grow, okay? That makes them pretty precious and a few years, I think. And, uh, you know, we've had gardens, never did super well at, at our gardens, really, which makes every little piece of fruit that you get all the more, you know, precious to you because you know you're not going to have a whole lot. But let's say you're living off of that. You can't just go to the grocery store and buy all your fruits and vegetables and all that stuff, but you're living off that. And so you've got an orchard with all these fruit trees, and you've got 
some plants with the fruits and vegetables and all this stuff growing, and you planted all that in March, right around here, that's when you'd plant, the end of March. And right around the end of June, you know, you're seeing the fruit come up. And you see that green tomato, and finally that green tomato turns red, and everybody's like fighting over, like who's gonna be the first one to eat that ripe fruit, okay? <laughs> Can you imagine if you said, hey, every time we, these, this fruit starts ripening, that first fruit that we get that ripens, we're giving that to the Lord. Because really all of it's His. He gave us all of this. And because we love Him, we're saying, you know what? I'm not even going to uh, eat that. I'm just going to give it to the Lord. Now, I realize some of the sacrifices and stuff they gave to the Lord, they actually ended up eating. Okay, God wanted, didn't want them to waste it. But the principle, principle is that, hey, that belongs to the Lord. The very first thing that comes is the Lord's. All right? That's the idea of the first fruit. And notice in that verse where he says, do not delay. <laughs> this is actually a good, uh, good principle because let me tell you, if you get a paycheck, let's say, and you're like, you know what? I'm going to give my tithe this week or month or however often you get paid. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give, give to the Lord. And you delay and delay and delay. Guess what's going to happen? End of the week, end of the month, all that money's gone. <laughs> it's not like I'm going to pay all my bills. I'm going to get my food. I'm going to get all that. And then whatever's left over, hey, I'm going to go and I'm going to take and I'm going to tithe to the Lord. Well, you probably won't have a tithe left if you have that kind of a mindset. Uh, so the principle is it makes sense. Of all your increase, right, your paycheck, gifts, whatever you get, if you have this mindset that whenever I give that, I'm going to take that 10%, set it aside, that's the Lord's. I'm not going to spend that. You'll be surprised, okay? And I'm not trying to be some prosperity preacher up here. <laughs> Please don't think of me as that. But you'll be surprised how God will allow your money to go a long way if you have that principle. He'll allow your things to last longer. He'll allow things because He's blessing you, you know, for doing that. Boy, I sound like a, a prosperity preacher, don't I? <laughs> Let's have an altar call right now. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. So he said, do not delay. And then he says, of all your increases, the principle. Look at Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Verse 9. Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with and thy presses shall be mixed out with new wine. And then he goes on to talk about other things. Now look, you could say, now that was under the Old Testament. God doesn't do that in the New Testament, right? Like he just did that's he did away with that. That was giving in the well, don't you still love the Lord? Don't you still love his work and want to see his work prosper? Don't you still think that he deserves at least the first fruits of everything that you get. You know what I mean? That's the principle, okay? That's the principle. So uh, we see the uh, obvious purpose, the original principle, and, uh, and let me just say just real quickly on B. I won't take the time to go there, but if you look at Numbers 18 and other, several other places in the Bible where it talks about this principle of the tithe, which you understand tithe means tenth, okay? And so what they would do is they would give up their tithe, and basically, and I'm a, we'll look a little bit more about this later, but basically when they would bring that, there were those Levites who had specific jobs in the tabernacle or later on in the temple, and their specific jobs were to do the work of the Lord. Uh, they, 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 you know, took care of all the details and everything that was to be done inside the church, and they spent all their time doing that. And so, therefore, they didn't have their lands and all and their fruits and vegetables and all this kind of stuff. And so, the way that it was set up was when we give of those tithes, we'll take a tithe of all that. Uh, and it was like a every three years thing. They would just have these store up, and they would take that, and we'll just give a tithe. And that is how the Levites will have their stuff, all right, because they don't they live of the, the ministry, right? So, they don't have the... Um, you know, the, the, the houses and the lands and all the things that the, that the people have. And I, you know, and I, just real quick, I, I've thought about this myself. Like, like uh, a lot, I've known a lot of people in the ministry, like pastor, full-time pastors, missionaries, whatever, 
uh, who they don't get a paycheck and then take that paycheck and that money, some of that money goes towards their house or something like that, right? They are just part of their salary is that the church provides them a place to live, right? But then, I, and, and sometimes I've seen where that, what happens is as, after that person is lo, no longer in the ministry, quote unquote, I realize we're all in the ministry, but uh, full-time ministry being paid, uh, paid to do that work of the ministry, that sometimes they'll retire, health will get bad, or maybe they'll do something stupid and get kicked out of that church or whatever. Now they've got nothing. They've got no property. They've got no, no houses, land, or whatever. And I've often thought about, man, I don't want to be in that situation. I don't want to get to the point where, you know, uh, I, I'm no longer in full-time ministry and I don't own any property, any land, or anything like that. And there's been that within me that's like, maybe I should figure out another way to store up some money and figure out a way maybe or maybe the church will pay, instead of giving me maybe that, that house they'll pay me like a salary and then uh, maybe i mean extra money that much money and i could put that towards a house that i might own one day or whatever i understand where that thinking comes from but i'll tell you this there is something very very special about the level of faith that says you know what i'm living paycheck to paycheck off of whatever god provides for me I'm not saying everybody has to do that. You have family you need to take care of. You need to be responsible and all that kind of stuff. But there is that which says, you know what? Tomorrow, I might get kicked out in the streets and not have anything. But right now, I'm just living for the Lord. <laughs> I'm just going to you know, rely on Him uh, giving me things. If you think about it, that's kind of what the Levites had to do. The Levites had to live like that, just, you know, just suspecting that people are going to uh, uh, pay and all that. And just... And for the record, just, I don't know, I don't need to say this, but just for the record, nothing from this work right here goes towards me. Because some people get that idea, like the, everything that goes in the offering plate, like that's for the pastor. I don't get anything from this work right here, okay? Uh, now, I do get paid sufficiently. I'm happy with what I get paid in Iola. Okay, praise the Lord that I've been able to do that. If it wasn't for that, I don't know that I'd be able to do this. And come up here, you know, the days that I do and still be able to be full time and working in Iola and all that kind of stuff. So praise the Lord that the Lord's allowed me to do that. But just so you know, I'm not trying to get money and stuff like that so I, I can put it in my bank, right? The idea of living off of living from the gospel, I'll point to that passage later, and living in the ministry is just saying, hey, Lord, look, I'm going to give myself fully to the Lord's work. Not everybody can do that. Somebody's got to be able to pay for that. Okay, and so, you know, it makes sense to have this principle of the tithe. Okay, well, I wasn't going to spend very, very much time on that point. But, okay, so the uh, the original principle. Okay, now quickly, let's look at the ongoing practice. Now, there's more scripture here than than the other verse we looked at, probably, but I'm gonna I'm gonna try to go through this quickly. The ongoing practice. What do I mean by ongoing? Well, here's what I mean. It's not a dispensational thing where hey God was all for giving and living off the ministry in the Old Testament but then New Testament look uh, you know everybody's got to just work and give as much as they can give whenever they feel like giving or, or I don't know what what's what's being taught out there but <clears throat> let's look and see what the Bible says okay from because uh, people say we're not under the law tithing was under the law okay well actually this principle of tithing starts right away Look back at Genesis 4.4. 4. We already looked at that. I'm not necessarily that this was exactly a tithe, but if you see this right away, that first idea of offering unto the Lord, look what it says, Genesis 4.4. 4. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings. The firstlings. Well, what's, that? what's that idea? Well, not first fruits, but the first of the flock. Okay, the the first links <laughs> he gave of of the the animal sacrifice, but he's still the first links. You know, the same principle. He's uh he's giving that of the first of what God gives him. Okay, look at Genesis fourteen. I'm pretty sure this is the first place the word tithe is used. Notice this is still well many years before the law of Moses. In Genesis 14, uh, and there's, so there's no tabernacle, there's nothing like that. Genesis 14, look at verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. 
And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Not Abram, but God is possessor of heaven and earth. Be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand, and gave him tithes of all. And so we see that principle of tithe. Abraham to milk of all. Now, you say, say tenth, it says tithe. How do you know that means tenth? Well, if you look at Hebrews, it quotes this passage of Scripture, and it says he gave him a tenth. Okay? And it's just, it's, it's the Bible, thankfully, King James has a, it's like a dictionary built within itself. You can, you know, understand what things say. Uh, almost every word in the Bible has a definition somewhere. Okay? It's a tenth of all that he gave him. Now, uh, let's look at Genesis 28. Remember, all this, and I'm, gonna, I'm skipping over some, but all this is uh, before the law. So something that God put into the Moses law for a certain dispensation and nothing else. Look, like, I, don't, I don't believe in that. Genesis 28, verse 22. And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. This was this principle. How much am I going to give? Well, I'm going to give a tenth of the first fruits or the firstlings, right? This is the principle that we see very consistently within the Bible. Look at Genesis. No, let's see. Uh, so let's see. You got firstling, then your next blank there was tenth. All right. And again, uh, there's others I could probably look to. But then we come to Moses' law. And look at Numbers 18. There's no way for me to be thorough enough and have time to preach. I picked out a few places of Scripture where it talks in the law about the tithe. Let's see, Numbers, do not. Numbers 18. And look at verse 23. But the Levites shall do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be uh, that among the children of Israel they have no inheritance, but the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer as a heave offering unto the Lord, I have given to the Levites to inherit. Therefore I have said unto them uh, among the children of Israel, they, have, they shall have no inheritance. This was what I was explaining here, the principle of the tithe, it was so that the Levites would be able to uh, to have an income. I looked it up. Other churches are doing it, but I looked it up one time. Like the average uh, amount of the budget, the church budget that goes, uh, not just the pastor, but we would say to um, I can't remember the the word that I'm looking for here, but basically. Income to to employ the church, and probably it sits somewhere around like sixty percent of all that comes in. And you might think that that sounds really high, but look, this is a big portion of what the point is of the, the in. Okay, and so this is not this should make sense if you've looked through the Bible in this principle. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter twelve. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 10. But when ye go over Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord, uh, your, uh, the Lord your God giveth to inherit, and when he giveth you rest from all your enemies round about so that ye dwell in safety, uh, then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to uh, shall shall choose to cause His name to dwell therein. Thither shall ye bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and your heave offerings of your hand, and all your choice vows which ye vow unto the Lord. Okay, so this is uh, again in Deuteronomy. Look at chapter fourteen. Verse twenty-two. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year, 
and thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place uh, which ye shall choose uh, to place his name there, and the tithe of thy corn, and thy wine, and of thy oil, and the firstlings of the herds, and of thy flocks, and th that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. Okay, so this principle where their offerings and their sacrifices and their tithes, and this was all, there's a whole lot, it gets a little complicated how they did that, and every three years, and all this kind of stuff. I'm not in this. All right, so we have before the law, we have the law, and then we have Babylonian captivity. Now, let me remind you, one of the reasons they went into the Babylonian captivity, now, there was a lot of wickedness in the land. There's some that had gone into idolatry and stuff like that, but God tells them that the reason that they went into captivity was because, excuse me, they didn't, they didn't, uh, uh, what's it called? They didn't let the land rest, like the Sabbath of the land. They didn't let their land rest. They didn't follow any of the commandments. But he says, ultimately, here's what I'm going to do. Since you didn't let your land rest, you know how farmers, even today, though, farmers know that if you overwork a ground, it's not going to be, it's not going to produce. And so you're supposed to, like, let it rest every once in a while. Go let just grass just grow up and everything and go plow another field. Uh, this, is a, this is the principle. And if you don't do that, it leads to great problem. This was one of the reasons for the big dust bowl and, and all that that happened in, uh, I don't know what year. Uh, but anyway, so you're supposed to let it rest. But they didn't do that. So God said, you know what? I'm going to make sure that land is destroyed. And all your land is going to be destroyed. Bab uh, 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 Nebuchadnezzar is going to come in and he's going to tear down uh, the temple and he's going to you know, destroy the land, burn the land. It's going to be a wasteland. Okay, so this is what happened when they went into captivity. They're in captivity 70 years, and then when they come out and they go back into the land, they're like, hey, we've got to rebuild all this stuff. Hey, let's get the law back out, and let's see what God's law said. And then they kind of reinstitute some of these, some of these things, probably not knowing exactly how they did it beforehand because they're so far removed. And so they're just going back and rereading the law and saying, hey, this is how, we're, this is how we need to do it. The best that we can interpret Moses. I hope that makes sense. Okay, uh, look at Malachi chapter three. This is all in the same time period where the, uh, uh, King Cyrus is allowing them to go back into the land, and so let's see. Ruth. Wait, I went to. Uh, I, went to, I was going to Nehemiah. We'll come to Nehemiah here in a minute. But Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Might as well go ahead and find Nehemiah while you're waiting. Okay, here we go. Malachi. And this is, if you've ever heard old Baptist preaching on tithes and offerings, I always go to Malachi, okay? This is a powerful verse. Come on, where are you, Malachi. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Will a man rob God, yet ye have robbed me? But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even, with, uh, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now uh, herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you, open you the windows of heaven and pour, out, pour you out a blessing, and there shall not be room enough to receive it. Now, this is a great principle. Again, prosperity gospel preachers maybe have taken this too far. Some people that are greedy of filthy lucre and, and just want to consume it upon their lust or whatever, maybe will preach this with the wrong motivation or whatever. But look, there's this principle that says, God knows what you have. God knows what you need to pay your bills and all that kind of stuff, right? So this idea that says, I can't give to God because I won't have enough to take care of myself. Look, God's the one that is in charge. So let's say you say, let's say you have this mindset and say, look, I can't give to God because I need, uh, I need to pay all my bills. And you go out and get extra jobs and you've got all this income coming in. 
but God's allowing, because you're under a curse, <laughs> right, is what he said. So God's allowing, like, hey, nothing's going right. Everything's breaking down. Uh, nothing's working. You're losing all your money. Uh, you know, you just think, as soon as you get money, it's like the Bible talks about, like, bags with holes in it, right? It's just follow, fall, falling out. God knows, how, God knows how to make things last. Think about the children of, of Israel going through the wilderness. It says they caused their clothes to last for 40 years. That's impressive. <laughs> They didn't have Walmart clothes. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> Their clothes lasted for 40 years. God allowed them to last, right? And he is the one in charge of blessing. And again, it's not a prosperity gospel, but it's this principle that God says, hey, trust in me, walk in my ways, follow my plan. I know what you need, and I can make sure that you, you can have more with less. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you will trust me. Rather than be and say, hey, no, 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 I need more, I need more, I can't give to the Lord, then maybe he'll make sure that you don't, that you're cursed, basically. Now, now look, here's what I, here's what I think. People that aren't saved, people that don't love the Lord, don't care about the Lord, whatever, you know, he's probably not working this out in their life, just whatever. So you look at the wicked people and you're like, how do they prosper? How does Bill Gates have so much money? He keeps giving all these wicked things and we all know he was on Epstein, Epstein's Island, and, and we know that he's behind the vaccines. And, but you know, you're like, how could he be so wicked and he has so much money? Because God doesn't care about his money. That's why, right? And so how about a Christian who is just living a carnal Christian life, you know, and doesn't really care about the Lord, doesn't really want to grow? Well, they might be under a curse. They're under a curse of their own making, okay, if they're not following the Lord. And, and trying to live for him, they're, they're going, you know, I don't know how much God's going to punish them, chasing them. He will, no doubt about it, but maybe they're just never going to do anything for the Lord. And he's probably not going to deal with them as much. But those people who are serving the Lord, trying to walk in his will, he's going to constantly be teaching you this lesson. This is what I believe. Okay, so I believe it very strongly. So in my early years, maybe, of the Christian, of my Christian walk, maybe tithing really wasn't that big of a deal. Like, it wasn't something that God really just wanted to show me that if you give to me, I'm going to bless you. If you hold back from me, I'm going to make sure you know that I'm cursing you. And that curse can be defined in different ways, okay? But, and the, the illustration I like to use, because I've seen it in my life, when I was in Bible college and, fun, and, and my income was real fixed, and I had to pay my college bills, and I had a family, and I'm, it's growing, you know, i got kids now. And it was really hard for me to think about even the possibility of giving, uh, you know, to what they had was faith promise. Uh, which is another, I've preached on that before. It's a whole other subject, okay? And, uh, and I can't even imagine giving to that, uh, you know, but at least I can pay my tithe. And so I would commit to 10%, all right? And there would be some times where I'd pay all my bills, but like, 10%, forget that. It's already spent. I don't even have that. And then what I find sometimes in my life, I'm not saying God's dealing with everybody in this way, but I'm just telling you that this is the kind of stuff God will do for you. Uh, that I realized that sometimes that would happen. And then I would get like, I'm not kidding. And I get, I get, I get pulled over by the police a lot. Okay. But usually they, no, I'm not a bad guy. I'm just saying, <laughs> usually they let me go. I was swerving or, you know, cause I'm not the greatest driver <laughs> or I just was speeding a little bit or whatever. Usually they let me go. But I'll tell you, I remember going through a time where, you know, maybe I didn't pay my, my tithe, right? And the Bible says, the tithe belongs to the Lord, right? And I didn't pay it, so what was I doing? I was robbing from God. And you say, well, that's no big deal. Look, you're going to Bible college. You're wanting to serve Him with your life. You know, who cares if you miss tithe one time? So here's what happened. I'd get a speeding ticket. Guess how much the speeding ticket was? Exactly how much my tithe was. <laughs> Right. So there's this mindset that says in the back of my mind as a as a Christian trying to serve the Lord, live for him. Hey, I wonder if I had paid my tithe, if God would have kept me from getting that speeding ticket. <laughs> you know, maybe something goes out in my car. Now I got to get it fixed. Well, I wonder if God would have helped me not have that or a little uh, uh, fender bender. And now I got to spend the money on getting that fixed. I wonder what if God would have kept me from that happening. You know, had I, I'm not saying I'm not going to look at everybody that has a. Uh, a wreck or has a, <laughs> and say, aha, you weren't paying your tithe. 
look, God's going to deal with you in your own life on that. I'm just preaching this principle that I think is clearly in the Bible. After the Babylonian captivity, we see it again. I won't look at Nehemiah because of, uh, for the sake of time. So never mind, you can lose your place there. Look at Matthew 23. I don't know. What, I guess I got a clock up there. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know what time it is. All right, Matthew uh, 23. In verse 23. We're in the New Testament now, during the time of Jesus. Jesus walking around, and Jesus says this. In verse 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint, and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Just mercy, this ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Now, I don't know which one he's talking about. Which one is the not to leave undone, and which one's the other one? But it doesn't matter. <laughs> what he's saying is, yes, do both of those. Go ahead and tithe. That's good. All right? But the problem is that you're tithing and you're all worried about making sure every little spice is measured out and all that stuff. And you give exactly a tenth, but then you're not worried about the weightier matters of law. He's saying, look, you're supposed to do both of them, <laughs> right? Don't do one and don't leave the other undone. And this is a confirmation uh, that Jesus is giving. He approves of this, this tithing, this principle of tithing, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 9. If you remember what was the uh, obvious purpose, well, one was, you know, uh, to demonstrate our love for the Lord, and one was to give to the work of the Lord. The original principle was the, the to give the first fruits. Okay, you love the Lord, so you're giving your first fruits. But then also attached to that was this idea of the tithe, right? This is how the Levites are going to live uh, from the ministry, right? Now, let's look at this. We said uh, uh, Jesus approved of it, and now Paul's going to talk about that for Not specifically about the tithe necessarily, but you'll see that principle. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live in the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But I have used none of these things, neither have I done these, these things, that uh, it should be done unto me, for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe unto me, if I preach not the gospel. And if you look at the context of what he's saying here, He's basically saying, I chose not to live off of the money that you're, you're giving, okay? But he clearly says that this is a principle that is right, okay? It is right that they that preach the gospel should live off of the gospel. Those who are given entirely to the ministry, well, how do you expect them, you know, to live? Now, he chose to make tents and so supplement his income that way. A lot of preachers, look, they're not doing wrong if they have a full-time job and then they start a church and the church isn't able to pay them. So they say, hey, I'm not taking any money from the church. I'm just going to work my full-time job and then I'm going to start this church inside. A lot of preachers have to do that when they start out. That's not wrong. That's perfectly fine for them to do that. But that doesn't deny the fact that there's this principle that says, hey, they have every right and it's biblical to be able to live you know, while they're doing that, to live off of that ministry, how is that going to be supplemented? Well, it's that principle. It goes right back to the book of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. And this is, a, a, and all through Babylonian captivity, I mean, all of this has, is consistent all throughout the Bible. I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it just says, you know, that was Old Testament. That was just the law. Well, what about before the law, you know? You know, another thing that was before the law, uh, this principle of the death penalty, Right. If man, you know, takes his takes uh, if he sheds blood, you know, his blood should be shed. And this was a principle that was before the law. 
You know, you don't say that, hey, that was Old Testament law. We don't, we don't live by that anymore. Well, I think government should enforce the death penalty, you know. Uh, I would preach that, and I think there's a good for that, even in the New Testament, <laughs> okay? Because we're not worried about dispensations like these laws for these people and these laws for that people. Look, God's the same yesterday, today, forever. He doesn't change. Uh, you know, His people are, whether Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter, all throughout history, they were His people. If they had faith in the Lord, they accepted by faith, you know, His ways, they were saved. Old Testament, New Testament as well. Okay, so there's not this idea of, you know, you have the Jews and then now you have the time of grace and then we're going to go back to the Jews. But that's another message for another day. I believe the principle of tithes and offerings is biblical and, uh, and right. And so my suggestion for anybody saying, hey, I want to be involved. And I do get people that say this from time to time. I know I'm not super involved in, in giving like I should be and I want to. Hey, that's between you and God. I would never push anybody to do it. But if you wanted my suggestion, I would say start with the tithe. Forget about offerings. Forget about faith promise or giving to missions or anything like that. I would say just try to take every paycheck and say, I'm going to set 10% aside. That's going to go to the Lord, and I'll live off the rest. And if you just put God to the test, I hate to say it that way, but I'm not talking about tempting God, but I'm just saying he said, right? Test me. Try me. And see if I don't pour out a blessing. Okay, let's pray. Father. Uh, thank you for uh, your word and for your, this principle. None of us uh, follow any of your principles perfectly by far. And so we fall short. And uh, I just pray that you help us as your body to, uh, uh, to learn and to grow and be the best that we can be protected by your, uh, uh, by your word. We walk in it and we try to follow it to the best of our ability. And I pray, Lord, that you'll bless uh, those in here who seek to do your will and that you will help to grow us and draw us closer to you. And uh, we praise the Lord that, our, that your commandments are not grievous. And I pray that you'll help us to realize that as we grow in uh, knowledge of your word and in, uh, in faith as we do your work and see you uh, fulfill every promise you said you would. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.